We live. Well, baby? hi everybody. Oh, We're sorry, live. I interrupted you. Oh. Go. <laughs> no, you. No, you go, man. Well, hi everybody. That's what you said. I actually don't have a good. We don't have a good title for this talk. It's about, or for this conversation, it's about the price mechanism. But that sounds boring. So what I'm going to do, because I have less to say than you, is as you speak, I'm only going to half listen to what you're saying. The other half of me is going to be trying to find that right phrase that that little catchy tagline that's going to be the title of this of this here podcast when you find it just burst out with the title okay. i might be in the middle of a syllogism just we need to know it when we you find it, it colon the just yeah. price is my first <laughs> suggestion <laughs> <laughs> well we did want to talk about just price and the reason why we want to talk about just price is because the major thing that money does is sets prices for us I mean, we talk about the ma major purpose of money is being sunk into actual and real goods yep. for the work of God to build up the Christian kingdom, investing in that. Uh, we, but, but really, why money was invented was to help us be able to trade with people we don't know. That's right. We've talked about that a little bit in the Redemption uh, podcast where – uh, you're not going to trade with your mom or dad or your brothers and sisters. You sh you're going to rely on love. But uh, when in, within a village, you know, back in kind of tribal societies, money wasn't needed. But if you're going to walk 500 miles to go get cotton or asparagus mm. or something, you need to be able to trade with somebody right there on the spot, have – a re an immediate reimbursement so that the uh, exchange can happen. And you and you describe this beautifully as it being the assurance of a gift. So whereas normally within human gift economies, which seem to be the thing we develop when we're left alone, uh, normally exchange happened through reciprocal gifts. You give me this, and then I don't necessarily give you a direct exchange, but since we belong to each other, we belong to a community together, you know that I've got your back and that I will reciprocate, though not in quantity necessarily, but in kind. Something new will happen. Maybe I'll invite you over for lunch, something like that. Um, but when you don't have that community, you don't have that assurance. So what, what it really is, what money really does, is allows that gift to happen instantaneously. Yeah, exactly. And so when, when we're trying to come up with that instantaneous gift, they're trying to you're you're in the operation the mode of operation within justice mm -hmm. um, more so more obviously than you are in charity mm -hmm. but this is this is probably the first starting place that when you, when we look back at medieval christians who are thinking about this stuff they're trying to contextualize price within the holistic notion of of, of human human life of 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 the story that God has has set out for us, mm -hmm. and so and and primarily the guys that think and talk about this most are in the 13th century, and and the reason why we're I think the 13th century is, is special for this is not because that was the pinnacle of society necessarily, but because this is the first time that money really was reintroduced into the West. Um, there and was a huge. It was the pinnacle of society. <laughs> it may have been it may have been um but i think part of the fact that so many of these guys can reflect upon the economic phenomenon that they're seeing right. is because they've started to see a slight economic takeover right right right, right. Um, so that they, they actually have started to see a little bit of a fall in society so that they can because it's hard to describe water when you're swimming in it oh, totally. you know and and some and, of the research that you've done jacob has been on guides or manuals for confession so the awareness that hey we can mess up in this particular regard um in reference to setting prices, um, be, I mean, that became something that, that we were conscious of, that the society was becoming conscious of. Yeah, 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 precisely. So so the place to start then is to start with them and to say, mm -hmm. how did they see the, this idea of, of exchange? And they, they began with something we've talked about a fair bit, which is the universal destination of all earthly goods, that when God created the world, he created it and gifted it 
to all of us so that when we say this is mine, it's only relative to it most properly being his and to most properly being uh, something that we that is mine only because we've all generally agreed that this is mine, but not because there's real ontological, there's not a real ontological claim. Right. That and, and the fact is that God, when he created the earth, made it for all of us. So when we hold yeah. something, we hold something that was made for all of us and we have to, we're obligated to orientate it towards the whole in some way, towards everyone. Yep, absolutely. And so when when uh, talking about owning, mm-hmm. you're then also in the conversation of uh, exchanging one's what one owns for what somebody else does. But because, as you just said perfectly, that we are supposed to own for another, that our goods are there to relieve others' needs. And so they put all exchange, everything from monetary exchanges all the way through lending and even to alms giving, all on the exact same scale. It was the exact same scale. It was the scale that was, how are you going to relieve your brother's needs? Right. Oh, That's wow. where it began. So, so not even exchange, like... Like so, I mean, it sounds like Jake. It sounds like what you're saying is that you literally could not sell for profit. <laughs> that uh, that's yeah. I mean, that's true. So, this, and this is something that they came up over and over and like, over again. Is that what was the point of of a profit? And and of course, their their mindset is uh, for for merchants. Like because what a merchant does is that he starts with a project. Or he starts with money, he exchanges it for a product, and then he goes somewhere and he sells it back for money. So the end, the thing that he's left with at the end of the day is just money. Mm-hmm. And so he necessarily is after his expenses uh, of traveling, he's left with a profit necessarily. So they say, well, is that good or bad? And the answer by and large, is that it's okay so long as it's not a real profit. And so far as he's spending it on the cost that he has of taking care of his family, of keeping up his house, of giving alms, which is absolutely required, um, and that he then at that point doesn't have anything left over, then he's good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so profit's considered in terms of somebody's overall state, not just in terms of bu- business transactions. So, yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. God speaks about idolatry as that which does not profit. And I think that in uh, somehow there's a redemption of profit within Christianity in the sense of once you acknowledge and commit to the reality that it's always for another, then there is no profit that can harm you. There's no profit, like there's no gain um, that isn't orientated towards what's fitting for your office and for your care of others. So you aren't burdened by it anymore. You get to just be a conduit, you know, whenever, whenever you are a conduit. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So when you find, like, I'm thinking of, I think it's Isaiah 44, when God says um, that once I will redeem you, I will teach you how to truly profit Mm -hmm. in, in contrast to the idols that, do not do not give profit right which always and, amass, um, which always amass wealth you know right but but i think your point is great and something we've mentioned with if if a metaphor is going to work then the base of it has to be true um and uh and so if if we if, if a christian does find himself with it with an exorbitant profit well you know he, god's going to teach you how to handle that well so it's so profits a, is a is a really dynamic concept. If you find yourself with excess funds, it doesn't mean that you've you've necessarily sinned. I guess that's what we're trying to yeah, say. Yeah. Um, um, but but anyways, the context of just price comes to this overall understanding of relieving of, of of trading in order to relieve your brother's needs, and that can start from alms all the way up to business interactions, and and that also completely redefines what transactions are supposed to do it's not for a profit motive uh, it's not for for seeking of love of self but it or or dominating another it's it's for the aid of another and 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 the aid and this is i think something that we'll get into 
more down uh, into this conversation, but the aid is personal at this point. It's not something that just happens through systems and mechanisms. I guess everybody is surprised to hear that at this point from, from us. But, yeah, right. um, but I think, I think, but okay. So, so that's maybe a place to starting within the context. And, and then there's this very, and, and so within it, there's this integral connection between theology and economics. They're just bound to one another. Mm-hmm. So the just price is really tough because uh, prices, because justice is, is to render to each one his due. But that means that everybody is due something else. And usually when we think about prices, it's a flat rate for everybody, no matter mm-hmm. who or who they are. Right. Yeah. The cost of, of coffee beans takes into does not take into consideration how much I really like coffee. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so when you also read these scholastics, they talk about the just price as being something that needs to be discerned. Um, and that it starts out on a baseline measure uh, that, that uh, is really the average price that people pay for an item <laughs> in the market. That's funny. So, but they mean like an actual market, like when people buy this thing, what do they pay? Right. Yeah. But well, also market is for them is just a place in society. It's not the society as a right, whole. Right, which, right. Well, I mean, and this, like, this we, is, we this is really quite yeah. fitting, right? With maybe the broader discussion of a new polity in the sense that the just price is is ultimately founded on custom and and custom is exactly a law that's i mean it's not even a law it's actually the aquinas talks about it as the foundation of law um but it is simply descriptive of a people at peace so it's not that there is some abstract just price that you know through a lot of academic debate you could finally settle on hey 599 is what this thing is worth right (laughs) this is the assumption that i mean what underlies that kind of thinking is the idea that people are like inherently and thoroughly broken like they have to be that they can't figure anything out for themselves everything has to kind of come extrinsically um whereas what generally happens is when a society is at peace, it tends to do peaceful things. So if we are at peace with each other and we have friendships and within these friendships and within this peace, I want to sell you some bubble gum, right? Then I'm not going to break the peace by trying to charge you 20 bucks for the bubble gum and insisting Mm -hmm. on that in any way. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the meanwhile, you're going to not steal my bubble gum or try to get away with, you know, one cent. Actually, that doesn't sound that bad for bubblegum, but you know, I don't have a lower <laughs> number. I can't split the penny here. So the, the point is that the assumption of the scholastics and the assumption of, of the church in general is actually shockingly optimistic. I think it, it's shockingly optimistic, which is that the reason it puts all this faith in custom is because it just doesn't think that people are like inherently evil. It really yeah. does believe that people ultimately want the good they want friendship they want families and communities to remain intact they want to flourish as human beings and so if we look at a community insofar as it really exists as a community we can presume that it does so because they have real peace they have real peaceful activities and so customary activities which can actually be guidelines for subsequent um thought whereas i I don't i just don't even know now that we would even be able to think in terms of like well what's the customary price of anything because it's all just received really from you know you don't anyway we'll talk about that more later but it it does seem to me like rooting just price and custom is kind of radical in that it trusts people in in a radical way yeah no i think that's a really important point because if you find obviously the liberal theorists such as Locke and Hobbes, um, that they both presume that they both presume scarcity, which is a big thing. And then, but they also pre, uh, presume violence. Right. That and each is going to try to get as much as po- possible for as little as possible. Right. This is the right. assumption of human nature, that that's what we do. 
Right. And so Max Weber and, uh, and, and our, you know, our buddy von Mises actually state that they are explicitly Hobbesians in this regard. Gotcha. They believe that their anthropology, that Hobbes and Locke's anthropology is the same anthropology that they hold. And that this is why we need the state to be able to ensure, to threaten us with some sort of violence, that we are not going to kill our neighbor, but we're never going to be able to rid ourselves of our primary desire to have our own will fulfilled over and against the will of our neighbor. And so this yeah. is, and so they say that um, this is the competition of the free market. This is why we have a profit motive, because we have this this desire to fulfill our own will over and against the good of our neighbor. And that the only reason why it can be uh, co competitive within a market rather than bloody in a field as Cain and Abel had it was because the state was threatening us to uh, to mitigate just how competitive we were going to be. I mean, really, it's like the demonic opposite of the Catholic Church's teaching in the sense that where the church presumes peace and so can look to custom to set a price hobbes presumes violence right and so there is no customary price there's simply the price that's <laughs> won right like the price that has been in the end enforced by the state right exactly and there's certain ways in which and so maybe look, yeah maybe we can jump right into the some of the pricing mechanisms that you that you see today and and some things that the scholastics would not like about it and things that also sound arbitrary. So uh, supply and demand, this is the big thing that everybody mentions that the way in which you get a price in the market is to see how many people are buying, how much of your product, how often, mm -hmm. and then based upon the, how quickly your product is flying off the shelves, you're going to increase the price. If it's going, if it's flying off too fast, if it's not, if it's staying on the shelves too long, you're going to decrease the price. Mm -hmm. And so this works naturally. It's organic. Uh, and, uh, and, and so as a result, it seems completely just. That's, that's the argument that by and large today. Sure. I've definitely heard this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so th there's, there's certain questions that we have to ask because in, a, in one regard, that sounds a lot like how a customary price would arise. Um, is it not just by people making decisions uh, individually that you're going to ultimately have come come about to uh, a decision in peace? And so the questions then are, well, are the situations that we have today, are they actually uh, peaceful or are they not? Just because we presume or just because capitalist theorists presume violence does not really necessarily mean that there is violence within the market. Mm -hmm. So so that's the next question, I suppose. And I, and I think there's, there's a few things that the scholastics pointed out. Um, one is that the biggest one, the biggest overarching uh, theme for these objections are that uh, because our goal is to relieve the needs of our neighbor, anything that causes a false sense of scarcity or just false scarcity, not even a sense of it, uh, anything that f causes false scarcity necessarily destroys the peace, mm. and it subverts the reason why exchange exists at all. And false scarcity here, you just mean um, making it look like something, there's less of something than there is. <laughs> exactly right. So like, yeah, you actually have as much peanut butter as you would like to put on a shelf, but because people are displaying in some manner that they're very willing to buy your peanut butter, you up the price to, and it, as a result, looks like a more scarce item. Yeah. So, so one way, yeah. So, so let's take this, this first objection. We'll, we'll name two at least. <laughs> uh, the first is, uh, what, what St. Augustine calls buying low and selling high. And I think it caught on because a lot of people talk about that. That's one of these things that was expressly condemned throughout the tradition. Right. St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, uh, you know, of course, jumping over into the Middle Ages of Blessed John Duns Scotus and St. Thomas Aquinas. It's just one of those no-nos. 
And the big reason why it was a no-no is because if you're buying up a share of goods, you are causing some sense of false scarcity Mm -hmm. in the market that is then going to drive up the price. Now, you might say, no, I think the price was going to go up anyway, and I was just trying to get in early. Well, great. Then you're in this problem that we've talked a lot about, which which we're calling wealth without works. Um, Now, Within, but but the but the main objection is that you are storing up all these you know loaves of bread when there are hungry people outside. Mm-hmm. You know these are just the easiest examples to 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 begin with. Um, but also related to that is the idea of monopoly. You know, I think you know today by and large people don't like the idea of monopoly, or at least uh, free market right wingers don't like the idea of a monopoly. Uh, because it, because the reason why they don't like it is because it destroys competition in the market. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, that's true. It does destroy competition in the market. But the reason why the medievals didn't like monopoly is because that was, again, a way in which people could artificially control the price, in which way it was not developing organically out of custom but was really the juridical fiat of somebody at the top. Right. Um, and so this, one, this one's also kind of a tricky thing. And something I'll just kind of add on to the uh, scholastic insights is that when you look at most corporations, the way in which they get their prices is through monopoly, uh, m- monopolistic strategies. So you don't set the price for what the cost of, Microsoft Office is. Right. Microsoft just sets that and then makes it necessary for the whole world to, to have it. You don't set the price for uh, for, for Starbucks coffees either. Uh, they really see what we're buying at and what we're not buying at. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a just price because it could be that somebody just really needs the product. Now, off. Office may be a better example than a coffee. I don't think coffee is a good example. But, of course, everybody then turns to uh, to hurricanes. And it's like, okay, your houses are destroyed. You need wood. You need plywood. You need nails. Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to jack up the prices then, especially if, you're, if you know, there's only five major suppliers in the U.S. or whatever it may be? At that point, it seems like there is a false control of of a just price Mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah so far i mean it it just seems like once you imagine that the point of doing business is to make money rather than to aid your neighbor then there's no reason that in having all the things for sale you're not going to look for um, you're not going to look for what best aids your neighbor. You're going to look for what uh, makes the most money. And so then your calculation, like your motivation is fundamentally different. Um, you're, you might be constrained a little bit by competition, but what you're fundamentally doing is saying, okay, here, here is this good that the Lord has given to us. I'm going to take it and find out exactly how much people will pay for it before they don't pay for it, Right. Mm-hmm. that's very different than deciding on a just price. That's just deciding on the most price, <laughs> um, <laughs> which, you know, and, and this is not to deny that given competition, right? Given an intensity of competition that this route can find in certain areas, um, can find prices that are generally amenable or close to what we might Mm -hmm. imagine custom would otherwise produce. Like if we were actually engaging Mm -hmm. in markets where we were talking to each other about prices. Right. Um, But I think number one, that obviously isn't true for a lot of things, especially things people really need, for instance, Mm -hmm. medicine. Right. Um, And it's just the point that I really only a Christian or a Catholic would care about. I imagine um, is that, the merchant's soul is ill-formed because even if the result approximates justice, his will isn't good. His will is simply um, to rip off his neighbor. And then he's constrained by external influences of competition to not rip them off that bad. That's not 
that's not good. That doesn't make for happy people. <laughs> and it certainly doesn't make for a peaceful community in which to trust custom to guide things like prices. So yeah, I think, yeah. I think I understand that much. You know what I was thinking of as you said that was, um, a title, uh, and the title was, <laughs> no, I don't have one. I was thinking of riots because I read this, um, article by E.P. Thompson, who's like a socialist historian, um, English guy. And he, I guess I don't need to say that one. His last name's Thompson. Um, but he investigated uh, bread riots in England um, around the time of what we might call the birth of capitalism. And he found, and we think of riots, we think of these sort of uncontrolled events where people are very passionate breaking windows and, and burning cars and such. Um, but he found the funniest behavior in these like peasant riots, these bread riots where they would do things like, um, attack a miller's house, take all of his grain. And then right where you expect as someone who understands what riots are like, Oh, then they're going to like burn it or steal it and throw him in the river they might have thrown him in the river, but they took his grain to market, sold it at its customary price, then gave him the money. The point <laughs> that that Thompson was trying to make is that there was a real, and this is late, but there's still a real conviction that it was unjust to mess with the customary price, right? And mm -hmm. that people, as a people, were willing to enforce it, right? Not not out of this desire for gain, right? It's not like the rioters are like, okay, we want as much as we can get, so we're going to steal it or anything like that. It was an actual enforcement of the peace saying, hey, you broke the peace. We're going to enforce the peace, right? And in England, the king would often recognize this as valid, right? They were appealing to, I mean, there were bread, there were actual laws at this point sort of setting the price of bread and stuff based on custom, which is totally how good laws should work, right? That they should be based on custom. Um, but you cannot even imagine that happening in our society today where there was such a love for the peace and such a belief in, in a custom that people who were offended by, say, a rise in prices would seize the goods, sell them at the right price, and give the money to the sell to the guy who had the goods in the first place. I mean, that's <laughs> it's just shocking. Anyways, but I think I think that, but that also just you know goes to show that the Hobbesian narrative is is wrong. Oh, it's super wrong. You know? It's super wrong. And and the fact that we, but but the further we get into this monetary economy, the more and more it looks like yeah. it's right, and the more and more we start to perceive reality uh, in the ways that it is operating. Right, and and the uh, the stranger our our past becomes to us, right. Yeah, because we look back yeah. and we're like, who are these psychopaths with their like weird religious laws about being mad? And it's like, no, that's yeah. exactly what they were. There are people constrained by the laws of religion to only be mad in certain ways. It's like, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, one of my friends was just visited by by uh, his his in law and saw that they're they're kind of starting to form a community like what we have in Steubenville and. She's just kind of dumbfounded. She says, you know, when I come from this just couldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of sad in one, one regard is that we've completely lost the imagination of goodness, sure. um, which is, which is real. But anyways, in, uh, maybe we should jump back to the middle ages and, or at least to the scholastic ideas of how to find a just price. Because if you start off with a customary price, yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the price that you settle on. It just means that the one that you start your mm. uh, your conversation with. So, so as mentioned, money begins as a medium by which with which somebody can uh, trade with somebody they don't know. Mm -hmm. But within the Christian vision. You're coming to meet somebody new right. that you're trading with. It's not so much that they're a stranger and you're just going to hand over cash and they're going to hand over your coke. It's that that's an opportunity to get to know somebody. Now, th that might be a kind of a misleading example because the person that's selling you the coke is not the person that's making the coke, you know, as, sure. as they had in mind. But uh, but go with me here. Uh, the the establishment of the just price has to be. Um, through getting to know the other 
where they are, what they need, mm -hmm. uh, so that if you find that they are actually in need of, of, a of a necessary good, you are not hiking up the price, but you're dropping the price. Uh, or on the other side, if you so want to get this one object, St. Thomas you know, uh, uses the example of a horse, mm -hmm. and you are just so excited about this horse, and it's going to be a huge benefit to you uh, monetarily, but also just you're going to enjoy it. Well, you can pay the person more than what he's asking for. Yeah. So the seller can sell it for less. The buyer can buy it for more. But it's all within this discernment that is based in virtue first and getting to know the other, which is all that virtue really is. <laughs> right. So the customary price begins the discussion, right? So we say, hey, we're people at peace in some way. I mean, the very fact of us meeting suggests that. And so here's what people at peace have normally decided upon. Now, what's your particular circumstance? How do you particularly fit within the piece? Yep, exactly. Uh, and so, uh, it, but of course you might get dis get to a point of disagreement right. saying, well, I think that's still a bit too high. I still think that's a bit too low. And Blessed John Duns Scotus says, well, this is why you need to have that primary attitude of gift giving mm. in every single monetary exchange. That same gift giving that, that, puts monetary exchange on the same scale as almsgiving wow. so that when you hand over your 20 bucks or whatever say it is and you think you're paying a little bit high you have that generosity of soul and that desire to aid the other person to want to see that gift bless them uh, that that ultimately ascends you to heaven but also that binds people together and so it's a it's you know unlike the guy who's saying, you know, I feel like I got ripped off or even the person that walks away from uh, the discount rack saying, oh man, what a great deal I scored. Mm -hmm. This is, it's not, it's not about the self. It becomes about the other. Yeah. You know, it's depressing though, all that, because we're so totally devoid of any kind of, I mean, and not to be like cryptic or, or conspiratorial about it, but it just seems like our society is pretty much designed such that whenever you arrive somewhere, the price is not available for negotiation, nor is not even the, I mean, not even the creator, the seller, sometimes not even the like, you know, person behind the counter isn't even there anymore, where there is no opportunity for knowledge of the other for exchange or for any kind of transaction to be a gift. Right. And I think as a result, the price, like that we have all these inner workings of prices for various things, those prices almost seem transcendent to us, sure. where mm -hmm. it operates above any single human person, even over any group of human persons. Like we all of a sudden don't have control over it. It is a static thing that then begins to, to, to govern order and to orient all of our life like truth, goodness, and beauty are supposed to. Sure. Yeah, and no, absolutely. I mean, the very thought of of something like two ninety nine, dollars which is funny, right? The, the 99 cents thing is sort of like a symbol of this because it is purely the product of corporate marketing, right? That people who see two ninety nine dollars are more likely to buy it rather than $3 because, you know. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that our price, the, the way our prices look, right? 99 cents, 98 cents that itself is a mark of how detached they are from custom and from any kind of actual decision between people and how much they are, I mean, a product of mechanism, you know? I mean, that's why mm -hmm. we call it the price mechanism. It sounds like what you're saying, Jacob, is that within a Christian society, it's just wrong to talk about a mechanism for establishing prices. Like the very idea of saying, like, we're going to do this me mechanistically is wrong because even if you do set a price by law the law is based on custom and the custom is based on those conversations right that, that actual yeah. communal um piece right wild yeah precisely so i you know we you and i were talking just briefly before we started the roll of the cameras about where on earth we do find an opportunity to break through the transcendent price barrier and tipping was your idea. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. tell us, tell us about well, that. Well, tipping has always fascinated me. As a young, as a young man, I watched the movie Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino. I don't remember it being 
particularly good, but there's this discussion at the beginning. Um, I mean, there's really good music. I remember that. Uh, there's discussion at the beginning, and it's like one of those awesome, like long, meandering Tarantino conversations where you're not sure what the point is, but you think someone's going to die at the end of it. Um, <laughs> where uh, they were talking about tipping, and, and they have this one guy who's taking the position that, um, why should I tip? You know, like I come in here, I pay for, you know, the cost of the food and you set the cost of the prices or the prices. Like, why am I obligated to have this additional, um, payment that I give? And it fascinated me because it struck me like, whoa, yeah, like there is nothing illegal if I go to a restaurant, have a meal and give the waiter nothing right but that's not what's incredible what's incredible is that despite this fact people tip and mm. they tip to such an extent and to, with such regularity that tipping could become built into a system of like an industry right so the industry can actually say okay because people can normally naturally and with great consistency be expected to just give um to essentially set for themselves a price of service and give it to another person then we can pay our waiters less right so we can pay them like three bucks an hour on the presumption of tips so there's something evil about that i think right like it sort of takes the obligation off of the employer to themselves set a just wage but what I think is more incredible is that there's something so good about people that they can be relied on to provide for an entire industry, not on the basis of a fixed price, but on the basis of a sort of customary, literally customary, right? We say like, well, tipping is 15%. Why? Well, because people tend to tip something like 15%. Okay, <laughs> so we're talking about a custom here. There's no law. Now, of course, sometimes when you can't count on tipping and as our society decays and people don't give anymore, more gratuities will be just added to the bill, et cetera, which I think is yeah difficult, right? Because Pretty much standard here in England. Is it really? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's sad because I think you lose the opportunity of, I mean, it, what it... That little sign, like gratuity included, which is insane when you think about it. Like, how could a gratuity be included that's just called paying people? Like, <laughs> come on. But that little sign is just this, like, little, even, even in their continued use of the word gratuity, it's saying, like, hey, your natural impulse to give on top of exchange, right, for the sake of another, right? Your motivation that when you buy something, right, and you give money for it, that that money is supposed to be for taking care. Um, that is, it's so relied upon that we can even continue to call <laughs> just our prices gratuities. We can still, you know, just point to that part of the human soul and say, don't worry, we have the gratuity part taken care of. Um, yep. So I don't know. I just think that's a really cool part. And, and you even look at like, you know, coffee shops or just places with tip jars. Um, I don't know, people probably have different experiences, but when I was working fast food, people would try to tip me through the drive through window. And it was always this awkward moment because I had to be like, oh, my the company doesn't, like we're not allowed to take tips and such. And they'd be like, right, but it's a tip, so why do you care? And I'd be like, yeah, that's true. And then I'd take the money. Um, <laughs> but it's really funny, right, that we have, even there, there's a recognition that, yeah, the guy who's working the window isn't actually being paid enough you know, for anything but the maintenance of his life and survival, you know. So there's, yeah, so I think that there is a customary gift giving that is so strong in people that it can be relied on to support an industry, um, even if that industry is sort of being opportunistic about people's best, the, the best part of people. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and actually, I, I just remember that, that we looked this up, that, um, that tipping started in the 17th century when people would stay over at an inn and they would tip uh, the uh, the servants. They recognized that the servants weren't free, that they were working for another and that this could help uh, buoy them up in some way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's important is that tipping started with servants 
and recognizing that we're not in a different place than when than than that. You know, we're, it's obviously the service uh, sector, but I think that, that the terms uh, correlate for for a very specific reason that it is uh, it is operating in, in the same way, um, and so. I'm not really sure how to turn this to a practical thing other than uh, change your change the heart of what you're doing. Tip big. <laughs> tip, tip big, baby. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it's part of that. I think just a recognition of of gift. Yeah. And what and what we're, we're, customs can be dry, but renew the heart. You know, in the same way as when you're walking into Bass on Sunday, you're not walking in just because it's an obligation. Uh, woot woot the obligations back but the uh, but the fact that you are there to meet Christ and that every moment every 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 Sunday or every day you go is this marvelous renewal of of Christ's great promise on the cross um, and 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 moment with him uh, and in the moment of a sacrifice so uh, and so in the same way uh, the tipping has to inflame our hearts in, in a similar regard um, that that purchases should as well, and I and but but there's not a lot that we can do practically because systemically we just have a huge issue in our society. Yeah, we are cut. I mean, there's little. We're cut off from the neighbor um, in the exchange. I mean, you could burn down the Walmart, I guess. <laughs> they tried that in Minneapolis. Oh, didn't yeah, work. That's right. Yeah. No, but I, I, I mean, I jest, but I think that there's something serious that can be said here, right? That, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to see what the Christian society would look like. So sometimes what's easier is to say, okay, let's look at the principle and then let's look at why we cannot enact the principle within our society today. It's like, okay, um, all, all earning should be orientated towards ownership. Okay. But we live in a society where people can't do that. They're not making enough to actually own things. So then mm -hmm. the Christian society becomes an effort of reverse engineering. How do we allow people to practice thrift and saving unto ownership? Well, they've got to start getting involved in employee-owned companies and, and people have to actually establish employee-owned companies and we have to put pressure against companies that aren't. You know what I mean? Like you can start to reverse engineer it. And in a similar way, if we live in a society in which it is impossible to set a just price, then I think Christians need to be advocating for more actual markets. Like, and this can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a lot of really cool websites, especially in, in buying and selling and trading used things where you actually do have an opportunity to converse with someone on the price of something. I think this has been a really great I mean, it's weird and kind of annoying that it only happens through like totally alienated internet relationships, but there is a real restoration there, right? Where people are, are haggling and bartering and talking about why something is that necessary for them and what they need, you know, in order to make the sale worth it, et cetera. Um, in a similar way, like we can laugh at farmer's markets as being this sort of like bougie thing, but they don't have to be bougie. They could be actual moments in which goods which are usually seen under a transcendent price that you just bow to because what else are you going to do where there is actually a moment to talk to the person selling it and to hear why they need that much right and then to freely give them that much or to say why you can't afford that i mean i just think it's what people do normally when the institutions they build aren't so devoid of personal relation that there's no give um, there's no give for charity for love for understanding for discussion um, and I think people actually want to be a part of these institutions. I mean, I think if you asked anyone, you know, which would you prefer to go to a farmer's market or to like shop at a Walmart? Okay. That's a bad example. Most people would prefer the Walmart, <laughs> but you know, they're wrong. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying though? I think it's a, there's a call to action here, which is in the radical establishment of places and points of sale in which price is in fact negotiable so that custom can be developed. I mean, there's tons of ways to do this, um, but it all amounts to the same sort of thing is kind of get, stop going to fixed price places and start going to negotiable price places where possible. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm not trying to push back. I wish, I, I think that's right, but there, there's something about, um, starting something 
where there's it's 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 not going to support a family. You know, if you're working and you're I mean, your first obligation in, in work is to take care of your family and and to take care of others in doing so. So it's it's kind of multiple layers of, of love and, and, and make multiple directions of love at once. Um, but if it's if it ends up being a little bit of a gimmick of society, that's that's when it gets a little bit tough. And I just don't know the answer out of that. I think that there's I mean, a place like Steubenville, we might be able to pull it off. Because we I mean, setting up a market, and uh, we have so many farmers around where they can sell their goods, and the you know such a low cost overhead cost for doing it. Um, but but it's but it's tough for in other places where it doesn't just become um, well in the big cities bougie. Sure. And uh, and in other places, uh, it's just gimmicky. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. I mean, Do you like think of that when, the same way. Yeah. No. Because yeah. we've we've done this sort of work before in trying to establish sort of you know moments in which real barter, trade, and negotiable price is possible to actually develop relationships. I mean, we've done this when the first time you came to Steubenville, I remember was coming to our our open air market um, and getting, I think, yeah. a breakfast burrito. Um, <laughs> and, Delicious. Yeah. But yeah, no, I absolutely agree that, um, you know, even within the certain freedoms that come with a place like this, there was a tendon, there, there often is a tendency towards the kind of like selling of useless crap that no one needs because when, when you, um, try to carve out a space in which something different is possible, often what you're doing often the route of least resistance is to find things that no one actually really cares about, right? It's like you can negotiate over the price of um, a sculpture made out of tires that you spray painted red with the Ohio Buckeye symbol on it. Because what the heck is that? You know what I mean? Uh, maybe that's a really niche problem that I've had that I shouldn't... <laughs> But but the point is that it's like on us. we don't do that with necessities. The only place where I see Jacob where there's a real possibility is in food and food and drink. Where, yeah, it is a necessity. We all need it. It's very serious, but it is such so obviously connected to the initial gift of creation, in the sense that mm -hmm. you really can create an abundance of eggplants where you're a little more detached from like some strict set price when you bring them for sale or, or exchange or barter that I think there is a, um, there is a place for that to return. And I think that's why it's farmers markets that have sort of begun some of this, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree at the very least with your pessimism that largely have failed to realize any kind of radical potential. <laughs> well, but no, but I, I mean, I would like to see, yeah, I mean we're we're trying to push it. We're 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 hopeful, but uh, and we'll let you know the status of it, everybody. You know? <laughs> now, now we're just now we're just talking among ourselves, and we happen to have an. I mean, this is embarrassing. This is like yeah. <laughs> now I feel like my audience is now is now spying on me. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, we're just we're just. That's how it felt like to be on that show. You know, it's really? like you're talking to a buddy. You know, for three hours, and then it's like we're all the freaks listening to us. Yeah, you know, okay. so. why are you guys still up? Jeez. <laughs> Okay. Kidding, well, we better cut it short, things. We don't want we don't want to turn people into into spies. I'm sorry, everybody. We we hope this is helpful. And, and, not, and you know, uh, th and this yeah. is a general. You know, in many of these, obviously, we're all rookies here. We're just trying to figure out what the sort of contours of the Christian society looks like. So, if you have, you know, places and spaces within your society and your community and your family and your world where you have been able to find ways of establishing just prices um, for goods and services that is are replicable within other societies please tell us we'd love to make a list because yeah, um, yeah I mean we admit there's no there's no breaking open the world overnight and then you know putting the Christian society in its place but I mean there's no other way to start but to start small I guess totally totally let us know. Thanks for following with us, uh, and we'll see you next time. Peace.